plenary floor. My name is Lou Coleman, and I have the honor and distinct pleasure of not only serving as the president of the Gordon Bay Moore Foundation, uh, but also of moderating this session. Um, in thinking about this particular session and its juxtaposition to lunch, uh, and the dreaded afternoon slump. Uh, I thought I would avoid lengthy introductions to the panel members who really need no introduction. Um, they will appear as it's listed on your program. I'm sure all of you know them. Uh, they do us great honor to be here. And what I thought I'd do is just spend a minute and do something a little bit different, and that is pose a question to all of you before we even hear what's going to be said. The subject today is meeting immediate needs and we're clearly going to hear about some compelling immediate needs. But as all of us know, and particularly if you look at the schedule of the day and think about the immediate needs we're talking about, these immediate needs all have long-term causes. And this causes one of the most interesting problems, I think, in philanthropy today. And that is, how do you meet immediate, compelling, dramatic, heart-tugging needs? immediately and dramatically without really thinking about the root causes, without trying to do something that is permanent. Uh, this is a classic dichotomy and philanthropy that we all face. It's one we're thinking about as you hear the presenters today. So we will start with Chris. for the kind introduction. Um, I'll be brief. Um, it was brief. Um, first, I'd like to begin by saying that um, we at Oxfam feel it's extremely important for Americans to be reflecting more profoundly than ever on our place in the world at this point in time, and, and moreover, to reconnect ourselves as Americans to internationalist values and, and the tradition of internationalism in our own society and in our own political culture. And one of, I think, the important subtexts of this meeting is precisely that, and I just wanted to kind of publicly articulate that and how much Oxfam cares about that. Um, I'd like to, at, at the same time, thank uh, the organizers of this event for the boldness of their vision and for the opportunity to, to, to uh, join together with this important conversation. My brief this afternoon is to attempt to provide a very broad brush overview of the current humanitarian crisis in South Asia, with obvious emphasis on the events unfolding in Afghanistan and Pakistan and the immediate needs prompted by the crisis. This morning we heard Mark Malik Brown provide an excellent, I think, overview from uh, the point of view of the, uh, of the UN, giving us sort of the big picture, as it were, of, of Afghanistan. What I'm going to try to do is maybe um, provide a kind of a finer lens on that same subject. In the limited time I have, I'd like to try to do three things. Provide an overview of the um, immediate humanitarian challenges, offer some perspectives on the current situation as it's unfolding, and finally suggest some general thoughts on what opportunities might exist for philanthropy in the region, and, and particularly perhaps in um, Afghanistan. And I might add that my vantage point on this is not that of one looking at the issue from um, the center out, but rather I'm trying to look at it from um, the margins in. Uh, that is to say, from the point of view of, of the victims of the, of, these humanitarian, of the current humanitarian crisis. Uh, just to provide a kind of a, a context for the larger discussion, while there are numerous humanitarian crises in the world today, no one crisis is dominating the American public consciousness like the current humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan. Despite the fact that only last year India suffered a monumental earthquake we can scarcely recall when it happened and the extent of damage that it caused. To say nothing, and as Jim was reminding us this morning, there are many other significant humanitarian crises in the world. Congo, Sudan, West Africa, Afghanistan dominates the American consciousness. And, and that's both tragic in one sense, but an opportunity on the other hand, because it provides, an it provides a window on the issue of humanitarianism in the world today. Indeed, what is taking place in Afghanistan, apart from its links to the events of September 11th, is a tragedy of monumental proportions when measured against almost any of the major humanitarian emergencies of the last hundred years. And in order to give you some sense of what I mean by that, let me just sketch out for you the situation. 
Prior to September 11th, and this is part of the story that oftentimes we miss, Afghanistan had been enduring a three-year drought that had seriously affected the livelihoods of millions of Afghan families. As a consequence of the drought, some 3.5 million persons were receiving emergency food support through the World Food Program and a network of NGO humanitarian aid organizations like Save the Children, CARE, Oxfam, and a variety of indigenous Afghan NGOs. Meanwhile, owing to the drought, the protracted conflict within Afghanistan and the harshness of Taliban rule, another 5 million Afghanis had fled across the borders and were residing in refugee camps in Pakistan, where there were 2.5 million, Iran, 2 million, Central Asia republics, a half a million. With the onset of the conflicts in September, the UN estimated that there were another 3 million Afghanis in serious danger of malnutrition that had to be fed inside the country while the fighting was going on. This means, if you total all of this up, that during the height of the crisis this last autumn, that there were potentially 12 million, I repeat, 12 million Afghan citizens who were either in danger of starvation inside Afghanistan or residing in refugee camps along its border. That's an extraordinarily high number to think about the international humanitarian community providing an adequate response. So just dwell on that number for a minute. As we all know now, the situation has changed since the fall of the Taliban. So what can we say about the current needs of the Afghan people today from a humanitarian perspective? And to help you see that situation, perhaps, as that humanitarian agencies see it, let me offer you a quick and dirty frame of reference. Humanitarians approach any crisis, such as the one in Afghanistan, looking at it from the point of view of having three or four basic phases. There's the relief phase, when the mortality rates are extremely high, and the, the role of humanitarian agencies is to save lives immediately and as pragmatically as you can. There's a rehabilitation phase when we're trying to get people back to normal lives and, and um, uh, out of refugee camps and so forth. And then there's a reconstruction or development phase. So our goal in all these cases is to move from relief to reconstruction and development as quickly as we possibly can. Our key variable in, in, in making judgments about how to move across this spectrum is really mortality rates. In some situations, it's possible to move through this transition, this four-phase transition, rather rapidly. and others, it's, it's quite difficult to make those transitions um, very smoothly or rapidly. Post-war Europe, for example, moved quickly with Marshall Plan funding, owing to the established institutional structures already in place in Europe and the skill levels of its population. But in other contexts, um, movement hasn't been so swift. So with this framework in mind, how should we view the current situation in Afghanistan? What I'd like to do is highlight for you some of the key dimensions of the crisis that all of us, as concerned humanitarians, must monitor closely. First, I'd like to talk about food security. Despite the fall of the Taliban, the relief phase is not over, despite all the public discussion we might hear about reconstruction. And unfortunately, it will not likely be over for another 12 to 18 months, is what our estimates are. Why is this the case? Well, put simply, the drought is not over and security problems throughout the country have made it even more difficult to reinstate relief operations into some of the hard to get to areas. You heard, I think, at lunch uh, from Aral that, that also in, um, in the Central Asian Republics as well, the drought is persisting there and is affecting their, their work. So the consequence of this is that humanitarian needs will overshadow reconstruction and rehabilitation opportunities for at least the next year. For the duration of the drought, Afghanistan, unfortunately, will not be in a position to be food self-sufficient through its own production, and the effects of the drought, unfortunately, we're, we're learning day by day, are spreading to other parts of the country that had not been affected prior to um, September 11th, or in prior years. One of the interesting things we're learning is that food security in many rural and urban areas is increasingly a function of a household's ability to retain control over access to water for both crop production and household use. And interesting, what, interestingly, what's happening in, in, in the countries in the rural in the country in the rural areas is that wealthy families are managing this process well because they're digging, they're paying for it, putting in deep tube wells, and the poor families who have shallow wells are um, uh, finding it hard and harder to get get water because the water tables are sinking. So, given this enormous challenge of food insecurity, there remains an important role for food aid, provided it is targeted to vulnerable uh, populations. It's balanced nutritionally. It's delivered in a timely way, and it's well monitored. And the good news is the UN agencies and NGOs are struggling every day to meet these dramatic needs, despite the uh, uh, many of the constraints they, they encounter in the field. The second issue I'd like to, to speak to is the issue of security. I think Mark tried to drive that 
point home very forcefully this morning that, you know, for most Afghanis, the issue today is security, security, security. And as a uh, head of a major ma uh, humanitarian organization, I couldn't agree with him more. Um, in order for us to really move um, humanitarian goods into rural areas, uh, it's critical that the countryside settle down, that there be a demobilization process, that the mandate for the uh, security force be expanded. Um, while this is not something that perhaps you as philanthropists are able to um, address directly through your giving, you as citizens may be able to support efforts to broaden that mandate. So I, uh, I just would like to heighten your attention to that issue and, and as, as a major piece of what is important for humanitarian work in the coming months and years. On the issue of refugees and internally displaced populations, remember at the beginning I noted that there were 5 million refugees and um, it was estimated almost a million internally displaced people in Afghanistan during the crisis. Given the current conditions in Afghanistan, one of the problems that we're faced with is the kind of large-scale repatriation that would normally follow um, uh, a transition government of the sort we've seen looks like it may be premature or perhaps unsustainable. Why do I say that? Um, there's a concern that because of the drought conditions and the, and the food shortages in the country, we're going to see rural to urban migration of some of the populations most affected by the drought. So we may have unstable situations in the cities. If we then bring 5 million refugees back from overseas, where are they going to go? Likely to some of the same urban areas. Could create a very um, um, calamitous situation in the short run. So we need to look at, look at that IDP and, and refugee situation very carefully um, in, the near, in the near term. I'd like to talk a little bit about the agricultural sector in Afghanistan. As you may know, 85% of families in Afghanistan derive their livelihoods from agriculture. It's an extraordinarily important sector. Tragically, cereal production in the country is estimated to be below 40% of normal production levels. It's produced, producing, an, obviously, an enormous uh, internal shortfall. Also related to this is the fact that 60% of the systems of irrigation that have supported the, um, agricultural production, production in the country historically have been destroyed by this protracted conflict. Also, the livestock production base has been decimated, and livestock historically in Afghanistan has provided 40% of export income. So this is an extraordinarily important sector, yet many rural families have actually traded and sold their livestock or killed their livestock in order to survive over the last six, eight months. Um, and then finally, the, there is a problem that there may not even be sufficient stock in the country for animal traction to get agriculture moving again. There's a whole variety of issues in the agricultural sector that we need to be addressing. One question that hasn't been addressed so far um, in the conference uh, as we talk about Afghanistan that I wanted to underline for you all is the whole issue of mining and mines, um, or the demining process. As you may know, the, as a consequence of the Soviet occupation, there are some estimated to be 11 million mines in Afghanistan. It's an enormous number. And these mines are insidious. They're small, they vary in shape and size, and they've been seeded along all the highways and byways of rural Afghanistan. The UN and NGOs sponsored the mining operations were suspended during the conflict. They're only now just getting going again, but albeit slowly, again because of security problems. Unfortunately, the current conflict has added new mines and minefields to um, the current count that have to also be surveyed and removed. Um, before, the, before the conflict uh, began, there were 5,000 deminers working in, in rural Afghanistan. Uh, in order to really deal with this problem, we're probably going to have to double that number. But the important thing to understand for, for Afghanistan is there are great economic returns to getting rid of the mines because there are vast areas of the country that cannot be farmed because the mines are there. Livestock get killed when they walk through active minefields. Families can't farm their land. So, um, and there are estimated to be as many as 150 injuries related to mines a week. And there are 800,000 people who are considered disabled as a consequence of mine explosions in Afghanistan. So this is an extraordinarily important issue that we need to give some time to. Civil society in Afghanistan. Critical to the recovery and democratization of Afghanistan will be the emergence and growth of a vibrant civil society. The good news is that despite the harsh Taliban rule, there are some large and sophisticated indigenous NGOs that have been operating in Afghanistan, um, carrying out all sorts of activities in education, health, rural development, and demining before, during the Taliban rule, and during the conflict itself when they actually continue to carry out humanitarian work. With the fall of the Taliban, these NGOs have emerged again in force. New ones are appearing as well. Uh, and it's extraordinarily important to support the strategic sector. However, again, I'd underline what Mark said this morning, which I thought was extraordinarily on, the, on point, which is there's a tremendous opportunity uh, to support this, vibrant, this emergent civil society sector 
but it, there are problems in terms of design and implementation that one has to be cautious about. On women and children, the most vulnerable and affected populations in any humanitarian emergency situation. Women have been given a prominent place in the new government. Young girls have returned to school in great numbers, and clandestine schools for girls have come out of hiding. Women are returning to their jobs in the civil service. Health programs for these groups are slowly being restored. All this is tremendously good news. Nonetheless, it will be critical that women's voices are given more space in the processes and institutional forums where the institutional priorities of the new Afghanistan are being shaped. In other words, a strong emphasis on women's participation and leadership in building the new Afghanistan. It's still early, but there's still somewhat of a tentative quality to the nature of women's engagement in some of these structures, and perhaps we need to reinforce uh, and strengthen that participation, and there may be an opportunity for, for philanthropists um, to work on that issue. Three quick comments on critical issues beyond but related to Afghanistan and the crisis in Afghanistan. One on the diaspora population, and I'd like to comment on that because I think there is an opportunity for philanthropists in this, in this issue area. There is a considerable number of well-educated Afghanis who live outside of Afghanistan and Europe and here in the United States, and probably, I'm no doubt, there's no of them here in the audience today. And many are seeking ways to contribute to the rebuilding of Afghanistan. There are some tensions that have emerged between the diaspora population and those who've remained in the region over who has the legitimacy and commitment to lead the reconstruction process. And there is even perhaps a danger of excessive commitment on the part of well-intentioned um, funders in the United States and Europe to um, the diaspora population over the indigenous population of leadership in the country. That's something that can be worked out, but something to be sensitive to. But I think for all of us, there's a critical question of how we can harness this capacity within the Afghan community internationally to, to rebuild Afghanistan in some significant ways. I'd like to comment a little bit on the funding for the, for the reconstruction of Afghanistan. You may recall, and this is an important, I'm speaking to you now as American citizens, because this is an important point uh, to bring back to our leadership. You may recall that $4.5 billion was pledged for Afghan reconstruction in Tokyo some months back. However, you probably don't know that only a small amount of that money has been actually turned into cash and contributed to the reconstruction effort. And uh, if Mark is here, he can probably give us the exact figures, but I'm not going to put him on the spot. Um, the important thing, I think, for all of us to remember is it's, it's, it's critical that these commitments be met and that we simply don't go um, pledge these kinds of funds and then forget about um, our commitment to deliver on them. And um, as, as we think about the, the larger um, issue of Afghan reconstruction, we need again focus on the U.S. commitments and U.S. leadership in this area because other countries will only follow our lead. They will wait for us to, um, to fulfill our commitments. Another subject which has not been addressed terribly much in the conference so far, but I think it's one we, again, need to be mindful of, and that's Pakistan. It's a very important in the humanitarian sphere to note the burdens being borne by Pakistan during this crisis. It's important that the international community not forget Pakistan as an important player in South Asia. While there is unquestioned an enormous humanitarian need in Afghanistan, it is critical that Pakistan find its own path to development and democratic governance. And it's important that Western countries who have in the past been quick to abandon Pakistan for other pressing issues, recognize the need to invest in building, a last, building lasting frameworks for peace and stability in South Asia that include Pakistan. So I want to make a pitch for Pakistan as, as, a, as a place where there may be important opportunities for philanthropic giving, both in the humanitarian and development spheres. To, to, to move toward closure here, what are the opportunities for philanthropy? I know I've painted, a, I, I, I have to be honest, a challenging picture for all of you about the situation in Afghanistan. But it is important, I think, to recognize that important work is underway. There are things we can all do. Let me offer some comments on a way to view the situation. Um, and I, and I, I want to be very honest with you all here. Um, the first, the first what I'd like to do is present, present two caveats. The first caveat is, um, for those who want to work in Afghanistan at this particular point in time, doing philanthropy um, or supporting initiatives, it's important to recognize, as I think Mark again said this morning, this is tough and uncertain terrain. And there are real questions about whether, for example, one could do direct philanthropy with non-governmental organizations in the region from the United States, or whether one needs to think about more indirect ways of, of doing this kind of work. There are very good opportunities, but you must pick your institutional bets with care, and it, you probably want to bet on established players who can help you find your way and identify social entrepreneurs and the most promising sectors. 
The second caveat I, I give you is beware of absorptive capacity issues. This is a new fluid situation with lots of new institutions. They aren't necessarily strong and well managed yet in some cases. Um, and so your, our altruism or altruism, altruistic instinct can actually sometimes do more harm than good. Um, so we need to assess those, those institutions and those opportunities with considerable care. On the opportunities themselves, there's much public funding, the four and a half billion that I mentioned, um, theoretically, that's going to be focused on uh, rebuilding public infrastructure, you might say, from the center. For example, schools, clinics, roads, markets, government buildings, etc. And I would agree with the commentators earlier today who said that it's critical to rebuild the Afghani state. But there's much also to be done in rural areas. And it's in the rural areas where there's a desperate need for peace, stability, and livelihood opportunity. So in the spirit of trying to focus a little bit on this discussion of how do we move from relief to development, I would just offer um, some short ideas, and quick ideas of where, where I think investments could productively be made. First, in building indigenous Afghani NGO capacity. Um, we, need to, we need to build a social infrastructure throughout Afghanistan of civil society organizations. And there are some good organizations to be bet on, and there's some new ones coming into being that will that exhibit strong leadership that, that merit our support. Much has been said about women's leadership and girls' education. There are multiple benefits um, in Afghanistan, for Afghanistan society of, of investment, philanthropic investment in women. And I think we've, we've heard a good deal about that already, so I'm not going to repeat that. A related issue, I think, for Afghanistan and women's issues, which has been touched on but not talked about in, in any great detail, is the issue of reproductive health programming for, for women. Um, Afghanistan has one of the highest infant mortality rates and also one of the highest maternal mortality rates in the world. And this is a really a critical issue and a somewhat of a neglected one where, again, I think strategic investments could make a major difference. Demining. I think I've told you the story of this, you know, how dramatic the situation is in Afghanistan. There's good work, courageous work going on in this area that, that requires additional support. And then the whole area of agri re reconstructing the agricultural sector. There's needs for seeds, tools, irrigation, uh, reconstruction, and, um, and, and restocking of, of livestock. Finally, let me close on a, on a very hopeful note. While these challenges are certainly daunting, there's probably no more resilient and resourceful people on Earth than the, Afghans, than the, Afghanistan, than the Afghani people. They have proven time and again their ability to face tremendous adversity and marshal very scarce resources, not only to survive, but to bounce back and to flourish. In the aftermath of, of what has been a 20-year nightmare in which Afghanistan has served as the world stage for a proxy war in the fading years of the Cold War, and more recently as a victim of neglect by the international community, it is only fitting that the international community today, both public sector and private global citizens, find a way and find multiple ways to lend a hand and tap the resiliency of the Afghan people to build a lasting, just, and peaceful Afghanistan. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, and it's a great pleasure to be here. And let me add my voice to those who praised Jane Wales, who took this idea and sprinkled some of her organizational and conceptual capacity on it and brought us all together. So, Jane, it's a real compliment. Uh, what I'd like to do uh, today is, one, describe the evolution of one foundation and set of ideas on our own, which deals with a lot of the issues that have been talked about today and perhaps bring up a couple of themes that may not have been discussed as much as uh, uh, that might be. One, Lou, in answer to your question, how do you meet immediate needs, and whose responsibility are those immediate needs, and where is philanthropy's, where is philanthropy's goal and responsibility to fit into that? It's a very dangerous ground to get into, but very important for each of us to think about. And second, to think about our role as public advocates, uh, a set of responsibilities that I think we have very significantly and have largely ignored, either out of fear of our boards, fear of the IRS, or just general timidity. So let me, with those, I'm going to come back to those two themes if I might, but let me, first of all, talk a little bit about our evolution and how we think about 
some of the issues of health care, which I was asked particularly to address. The United Nations Foundation, as some of you may know, is a function of Ted Turner's philanthropy. Uh, Mr. Turner, five years ago, was extremely unhappy with the fact that the United States had a billion dollar debt to the UN. He has been a longtime supporter of the UN, an advocate of the UN, and uh, he got more and more frustrated with this. Uh, his initial impulse uh, was to pay off the billion dollar debt to the UN and then sue the United States Congress for a billion dollars. <laughs> Uh, that was not possible. <laughs> An individual also can't uh, take care of the sovereign responsibilities of the government, and so that the UN Foundation resulted from that. Mr. Turner said, I've committed the billion dollars, so now what are we going to do? And uh, so we began to think about what an institution would be that would help the United Nations. We are, uh, in answer to Mr. Goldman's question this morning, a spend-out foundation, $100 million a year over a 10-year period of time. We have a sunset. We're gone at the end of that 10-year period of time. But are we? That's the question that we're trying to sort through right now. Our central purpose is to try to strengthen the UN and to strengthen UN causes. In doing so, we began on the grant-making side. We've evolved from that, as I will point out, but we began on the grant-making side focused on three particular issues. One, and the single largest program we have, focuses on family planning and reproductive health. The next two are children's health and the environment, with special focus on global climate change uh, and uh, biological diversity. All three of those have in common the theme of prevention. And it has been our belief that the more we stay upstream, the better off we're going to be. But some of these issues are extremely difficult for governmental institutions to take on. Uh, supporting Thryo Bade and the UNFPA is often very difficult, often very contentious, requires the kind of freedom that philanthropy has to do. Same sort of thing with uh, many of the issues surrounding um, global climate change and biological diversity. So we have, Lou, a partial answer to your question, you know, tried to stay upstream and tried to stay on the prevention as to uh, what we were doing. But over the last four and a half years, we have found ourselves slowly but surely moving away from the funding of a lot of particular projects in these three areas, uh, women's reproductive health, environment, and children's health, moving away from specific project funding to thinking much more institutionally uh, what are we doing to actually strengthen the UN's capacity to carry out these responsibilities? Or to ask it another way, at the end of 10 years after we're gone, what's left? You know, should there be something left? And if so, you know, how might we help to create what's left? That has found, that has in turn uh, led us to think very seriously about the role that we play in helping the United Nations come to understand private money, private NGOs, private philanthropy, private business. The UN, like most other governmental institutions, has had over the last 50 or 60 years been given the responsibility for solving these kinds of problems. And like most other governmental institutions, is people by people, by individuals, who say, you know, give us the money. We when we've traditionally done that, given that money to these large institutions, and let them take care of the problem. Well, increasingly, you know, taxpayers and governments are more and more reluctant to let an institution like the UN do that. The UN, as like other governmental institutions, has probably not uh, stayed up with modern times as it should have. Institutions need reform and change. Kofi Annan is bringing a lot of that reform to the UN. But it's been difficult for the UN to take on a whole set of issues. Plus, there has been a dramatically declining budget. Mark Malik Brown's budget, I think, has declined by about 50% over the last four years, the budget at UNDP. Try Bay mentioned today the problems of her budget declining. This is pervasive across the UN and across other governmental institutions. So from our perspective, the trick was increasingly, well, how can we take our resources and help the United Nations to reach out and use the expertise and raise the money from and join and become real partners with the private sector. 
There's a lot of rhetoric about public-private partnerships, but how do we go about making that rhetoric become a reality? So that brings me, let me give you a few examples of what we've attempted to do, yeah, all in the healthcare area. In the area of polio eradication, when we began, uh, Dr. Brundtland, uh, the new head of WHO, asked us as a first uh, uh, responsibility if we would please see if we could jumpstart and reinvigorate the global campaign for the eradication of polio. Uh, this had gone along well in the late 80s, early 90s. It sort of slowed down and really lost a great deal of momentum. Uh, over the last uh, four years, we have, with the infusion of about uh, $30 million from Turner Fund, a significant contribution, about $50 million from Gates. We have in turn raised about $400 million, plus reinvigorated a partnership with Rotary International, 1.3 Rotarians in the United States, and hundreds of thousands of Rotarians around the world, plus engaged the World Bank in a different kind of financial institution, a different kind of financial arrangement, to use the soft loan uh, uh, capacity of the World Bank, turn that in the short term into hard money, and put that money uh, immediately into polio. We have spent a good deal of time attempting to build this institution of the UN's ability to raise money, the UN's ability to reach to different kinds of financial arrangements, to reach to different kinds of partnerships. We have found ourselves becoming an enabler of the UN to really do public-private partnerships. we become a kind of platform for that. We've done this in a number of other cases as well. About a year and a half ago, the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta, the great public institution around the world, came to us and asked if we could help with the issue of polio, or with the issue of measles. Uh, over the last year and a half, we have, by putting in $10 million, we think we're getting to a point working with 1,100 American Red Cross chapters across the country uh, to, we think we're going to enable about $200 million to go toward uh, to measles programs, highly effective, very, very inexpensive, highly effective, and, uh, you know, a great, uh, a great achievement. But again, using the Red Cross and becoming an interface between the World Health Organization, UNICEF, and 1,100 Red Cross chapters around the country. Again, we become a kind of a platform for this partnership and really defining what that partnership is. <coughs> a third example is AIDS. We've been very leery of getting into the AIDS issue as uh, we could see all of our funding flowing into AIDS. Work, what could we do? How could we most effectively use our limited resources? And a number of things we have done. We've become the interface uh, for private sector donations going into the Secretary General's Global AIDS Fund. We provide a promise to people the money won't get stolen. We provide the tax exemption to Americans that that money will come in and they can get tax exemption. We interface very carefully with programs identified by UNAIDS for that money. Now, what are those programs? We worked with UNAIDS to put together a menu of really saleable, really effective programs that UNAIDS could say, these are programs that work. We help them to define that catalog or what we call a menu of programs, and UNAIDS is now in turn advertising that to private donors. What we were doing was to enable private money to come in to the UN, to come into AIDS programs, to do so in a way again where people would have a sense that these are going to be effective programs and in also people in the United States would get their tax exemption. Finally, we're starting something new that will air in the fall. We went to the Advertising Council of America and asked them if they would help with their very significant capacities of putting advertisements on across the country, and we hope if it works in the United States, we can go to Europe and then across the world uh, to increase uh, public awareness of AIDS, that great capability of the advertising industry with free placement. You know, we pay the technical costs of making those ads. They give us the talent, and they place the ads. So with an investment of some hundreds of millions of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars, we think that this can have a very, we hope this will have a very real impact on America, on Americans, very real interest in AIDS. The tagline of these will be, what can people do? Again, they will then be referred back to the menu of things that they can be engaged in, or you can make a contribution in the following kind of a fashion. So again, becoming a platform for making this public-private sector responsibility work. 
Final example, Sarai Obey this morning talked about uh, the issues related to population and reproductive health. About a year and a half ago, uh, the Packard Foundation hosted a meeting at which uh, uh, Nafis Sadiq, Dr. Sadiq, the then head of UNFPA, came and told us it was stunning. The Packard, Hewitt, Gates, uh, Summit was there, I think, Rock Rockefeller was there, and um, and we were there, and MacArthur made it. There were five or six foundations. And Dr. Sadiq came and told us that there was a $65 million shortfall in the global availability of commodities. This is nothing else but commodities, condoms and Norfolk, largely. You know, the euphemism in official government UN circles is commodities. <laughs> there was an official shortfall of this amount, meaning, as Dr. Sadiq said, that there were at least 135 million couples in the world who wanted family planning services and could not receive them. 135 million. What well, seemed to us, this was about as immediate a challenge as you can think of, is that 135 uh, million. Uh, couples, morning family planning, but what a more basic thing to do. Well, we have created a coalition working on trying to do a lot more efficient purchasing of commodities, trying to raise this issue of commodity availability. A lot of philanthropies getting together, working with governments and trying to move uh, in this extremely uh, important area. So what we have done is to say to ourselves, how can we bridge this gap between public-private and we have now found ourselves moving away from an emphasis and satisfaction on individual projects to really looking institutionally, how can we become that platform? How can we become the enabler? How can we become uh, the kind of institution that people have faith in and that they in turn will say, well, we'd like to help to strengthen governments? But related to that uh, is the issue of public advocacy. And we have also, you know, going back to our initial charter from Mr. Turner to think about the U.S. debt to the U.N., we put together a very aggressive uh, press campaign and public advocacy lobbying campaign in Washington uh, with the tagline of great nations keep their word, great nations pay their bills. Ran this in a lot of, uh, ran this in a lot of congressional districts, key congressional districts that tended to overlap with the districts of chairman and various important committees, and also ran a very aggressive program on the Hill, which was led, by the way, by Haley Barber. Some of you may remember Mr. Barber had been the head of the Republican National Committee, but a great believer in the United Nations, and he has a constituency on the Hill that neither Ted Turner nor I could reach, so he was a very helpful person to, to, to explain this. In any case, we felt that this was a major responsibility for us to help make sure that the Congress understood how important it was to pay off the debt uh, of the UN. And that was followed, the success of that was followed by getting our peacekeeping paid off. The US had a billion dollar peacekeeping deficit as well. Now, why do I mention that? Not because you know we did, a, we did do a good job on that, but not because we did a good job on that, but because I think that that is an illustration of the kind of advocacy positions that philanthropies should be taking on and largely aren't. If we think about the size and scope of American contributions uh, to overseas development assistance, I think Mark Malik Brown this morning talked about a magic 0.7% or whatever it is. You know, most Americans believe that uh, 15 to 20% of the budget goes to foreign aid. You all know that. I mean, that's shown in poll after poll after poll. What responsibility do all of us have, thinking about global philanthropy, to be writing articles and going to newspapers and saying to the public, this is not the case. In fact, it's one-tenth of one percent, disgracefully low. We are the lowest of all of the, uh, of all the industrial societies. That is the easiest and most obvious one. What are we doing about landmines? The discussion was made here, discussed earlier about the importance of landmines. We and two other countries, I think it may be the Libyans and the Syrians, I don't know, are the only two that are not parties to the landmine treaty. And in fact, 10 days ago, the Joint Chiefs of Staff quietly came with a full recommendation to the White House 
to once again engage and use landmines as a weapon in the U.S. arsenal, running counter to everything that's going on in terms of public opinion on this. And what responsibility do we have to be telling that story or help that story to be told? It's our belief that we can no longer depend just upon the press to do this. The press often views this as a ping-pong game. You know, if there's a story on landmines on one side, there ought to be a story on landmines on the other. If there's a story on climate change on one side, there ought to be a story on climate change on the other. If there's a story on the destruction of species on one side, there ought to be an, an answer to that on the other side. Many of these issues are not ping-pong issues. You know, they are issues that demand our collective responsibility and to use our resources, given to us largely by taxpayers, let's remember, you know, to help to raise these terribly important issues. The issue of the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, the International Criminal, Criminal Court, global climate change, our commitments to free trade or non-commitments to free trade. You know, these are all issues in the public realm. And they are all issues that we have, we believe, a responsibility to take on and to help with. We don't have to tell Congress what to do. We don't have to lobby for particular pieces of legislation. It's not legal to do so. But we can describe very carefully in all kinds of different ways what, in fact, is going on. Which leads me to the final point. It is, we find it, and this is the very delicate area, we find it difficult to say that we're going to commit our funding, much as there is an attraction to that move, to thinking about, you know, the desperate food situations or the desperate refugee situations or whatever. That is largely, those kinds of issues, once we get to that kind of crisis, are largely the responsibilities of governments. Governments should be doing that. U.S. government, you know, which does in many ways a good job on food, it should be a lot better. Does a job on refugees, it should be a lot more. It does a good job on, on overseas development assistance, used to anyway, it's now tiny. You know, the U.S. government has a major responsibility. Governments have largely this responsibility. And the resources, the limited resources that we have available, we think should be going in the direction of also addressing clearly you know, what governments should do. We have a role, and governments have a role, and I think we all have to think through you know, how, we, how we individually think about that. So that's the evolution of a foundation. We started thinking we were doing a lot of individual projects. We found ourselves moving much more into what kind of leverage for partnerships, what does that really mean, and how do we become an enabler to get those partnerships to work, how do we think about our responsibilities in public advocacy, which are very significant? And, um, you know, we're learning as we go along. I think we've learned a lot in five years, the four and a half years. And uh, I've been fascinated to be here. I've learned a lot from this discussion. And when we come back five years from now, Jane, we'll crown you queen, and we'll have another great foundation. Thank you all for meeting. Thank you. I wish 
things could be that simple. And then I come here, and I kept thinking about it. And I realized that she had hit on something which we have all been sort of playing around or moving around, which is that the fundamentally in all the problems that we have talked about, they all point to a very basic crisis of a vision of a world that we are all confronted with. I will now leave it there and come back to it after I have talked about wonderful things like weapons. <laughs> the issue of weapons, I think, is connected very much to what is written here, order this. Interesting word, not international philanthropy, borderless. We are moving away from the idea of states, national security states. If we want to think about and work towards stopping this incredible threat, and when I say weapons, I mean small weapons, what are called light weapons, which you can carry with you, uh, small arms, nuclear weapons, biological weapons, all of them together, is that you cannot talk about them by and keep yourself confined to a geographical area. Let's take the example of small arms. If we look around, what we realize that two things have contributed to this proliferation of small arms all over this world, from South Africa to Somalia to Pakistan, with consequences which are very, very wide. Two things. Covert wars, low intensity conflicts. They could be part of international competition, or they could be part of some regional competition, the world of the world's war, or the low intensity conflicts. Affect spreads. Just to give you a sense that one study done in 1995 from a person in, in, in England did that, he estimated that maybe about 70% of weapons and ammunition meant for the gorillas who were at that point, freedom fighters, uh, the 70 percent leaked out of the pipeline. It just leaked. It went to Pakistan, is littered with weapons. In Karachi alone, the most conservative estimate of weapons is that there's a hundred thousand machine guns in Karachi. That's a conservative estimate. Uh, Kashmir is affected that conflict terribly at a terrible cost to Kashmir. Uh, drugs related to the and we kind of separate the two. I think earlier this uh, morning someone mentioned Pakistan and about a week ago, as you report indicated that Pakistan, which did not have any significant drug problem, people would get this stone now and then, uh, <laughs> is now has one of the highest opiate addiction rates in the world. So point number one. If we want to talk about stopping spread of conventional weapons, we have to look at regional conflict and particularly at America's foreign policy. Second point, and that relates to nuclear weapons. Much effort has been made, as far as nuclear weapons are concerned, to develop international mechanisms for deregulation, reduction, and elimination. In, not, in the last six months, we have taken fairly giant leaps backwards. 
the NPT review conference coming up in 2005, I really dread to think what the level of discussion would be. What have we seen in the last six months? Encouraging news of reduction in arsenal. Look a little behind, as someone sitting at Northwest did, and have been doing it for a couple of years, at Freedom of Information Act, and there was coming out of that. Now, it's, uh, these weapons are not going to be dismantled. There's a hedge. That's where they're going to be put in. They are totally redeployable in a very short period of time. What have you sacrificed in this process? You have sacrificed the very important part, transparency and trust. NPT will be worth nothing if there is no trust. So, again, what happens here affects everything else in the world, as far as weapons are concerned. There are few things come down, I think, and, 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 which go through uh, okay, uh, before I do that, let me just quickly talk about what people in our past of, of the world are we doing. And since we are talking about how we can support it, so let me move with, uh, somewhat in that direction. In our past, in India, Pakistan is the case I am familiar with, and there are some people here who are very central to the process sitting here. Uh, these have been individual. Social entrepreneurs, for lack of specialists, who have given their time, their energies, to and made the initial breakthrough in terms of introducing the issues of nuclear weapons, its cost, both human and its potential cost, and the disasters it can entail. They have gotten to a point where they can't, and they very quickly, with very little resources, these individuals <laughs> have brought this subject on uh, at the level of public debate. The reason they have been able to do it is because they were connected to as another set of social movements. They were embedded in society. So a person, and I know almost every individual involved in this process in India and Pakistan, they did not make it into this isolated, insulated, focused policy business. And that is a very important lesson I think we should learn. That in this country with that much work gone into these very focused strategic institutes, policy got changed. Uh, America simply walked out of anti ballistic missiles. It had been trying to do it for a long time, but that's another story. Uh, had, no one has been talking about what is going on with this. Uh, Mini nukes, which is a very dangerous development in certain ways because it blurs the line between conventional and nuclear in a very dangerous way. <coughs> Not much talk. In other words, impact has been. My suggestion is this, that if we want to, to seriously work towards reducing, stopping with the idea of getting rid of the of weapons, is that we will have to look both in areas where we fear this, there are fears of proliferation, and if the giving should be coordinated should, and here, support those organizations which work on these issues but are embedded in other set of programs. They are connected with social movements, some sort of social processes, movements, trends. Uh, otherwise, I don't think that we will make progress. But this is a, would be a very powerful thing if that can develop. We can bring people here, get them connected, also supporting individuals in the initial stages 
so that they can take in individuals in the third world or developing countries would again be a very important thing to do. Uh, Other technical things are there, that, you know, in which, again, we have to think about how we support this. Technical like one-year funding cycle has been so disastrous for a number of small groups who work very intensely in poor countries, because we think you don't have the institutional capacity to deal with the budgeting level, when there's a whole set of little technical issues involved there. Uh, reinforcing international laws. Again, bring the parties working in other parts of the world here. International laws are the only thing <coughs> that we have that we can use right now to control the spread of violence. Uh, if, and ultimately, finally, I think there's a very important point which uh, Stephen may very well that, that we have not heard much about how important it is to have Democracy, which is operative, which has teeth, which is not formal, the content of democracy. How important it is to support that. <coughs> is it connected with spread of weapons? Absolutely. If you look at the world, see where India, I mean, this is a very cruel example, I will give What happens in Gujarat? People burn. What happens in Karachi? Machine guns come out. If Gujarat had had the level of weapons that Pakistan has, it will be a disaster. Reinforce international law. Bring again, embed programs within a larger groups of the other programs. So, I think a move away from very dedicated kind of uh, making, which is totally focused on changing the policy, has really not worked. Uh, and finally, I do think that, let me come back to this, uh, one last but earlier point I made, that ultimately we have to start rethinking, historically, why are we here? This question has not been asked that much today. That was a surprise. How did we get here? We have to ask that question. And if we, second, while asking that question, we have to remember, which everyone has noted, how young the population of this world, particularly the underdeveloped world, is. Young people need vision. Again, funding of this kind, which is structured around larger movements, would help in contributing towards development of a vision. And I will end by saying that unless we think historically in large terms, translated into concrete programs, Afghanistan will become a metaphor for our time, and we must not let that happen. And Osama bin Laden, we cannot let him to be a sign of our time. One is at the breakout sessions following the meeting or in this building, and you'll see guides at the doors. The, thing, the second uh, announcement is far more important. There's a black alpha Romeo, <laughs> license number 3DML453, who either is or possibly was parked in the handicap zone. Yeah. Uh, and if you'd see Jessica Jackley, Jessica, why don't you raise your hand? Some place in the back. Jessica here? I'm not Jessica, but I can help you. You can help me. <laughs> so whoever needs to slink over to this side of the room, we're not going to. We should, we should probably take care of that. Uh, I think maybe I'd like to start with, with a question, just because it's, I guess, my prerogative here a bit. 
We heard, um, I think we heard a number of really interesting things. Obviously, some things that we're not in entire agreement here in the panel. But one of the things that we heard from all of the speakers was this notion that, that we need to make connections with the world. In particular, we need to collaborate or partner um, or find common ground. Um, these, I think, were the terms used by most of the panelists today. And the issue for a lot of us is that we need to bridge a gap. It's pretty important to create these collaborations and partnerships. And I think we all believe that the gap globally is somehow much larger than the gap is domestically. So I wonder if I could ask each of you to comment on this whole notion of are we dealing with a different kind of gap that needs to be bridged in global philanthropy? Or is it just a few technicalities and we ought to do, as Solfakar said, think big and get on with it, right? I might um, answer by telling a story. Um, uh, several weeks back, I was um, uh, attending the World Social Forum in Porto Alegre, Brazil, um, which was the sort of counterpoint event to the World Economic Forum in, um, in New York. And what was, I, I, it comes to mind as, as I'm listening to the presentations today because in some ways what was happening there was, which was largely unseen here in the United States, um, was a lot of what we're talking about. There were 60,000 people in Brazil at this meeting. Um, there were 30,000 young people camped out in an urban park in um, downtown Porto Alegre. There were social activists and social movement representatives and non-governmental organization representatives from all over the world. There were some six to eight hundred parliamentarians representing European, Latin American, African, and Asian governments. Um, and, uh, and there were probably eight or nine hundred Americans. Um, there were civil society organizations from rural America. There, were, there was one, um, one uh, advisor to a U.S. congressman who was present at that event, one. Um, so what was really striking was the fact that here is all of this social energy um, debating uh, issues of globalization, debating, uh, as Zulfikar has put it, a vision of a more just and peaceful world, and Americans missed the party by and large. Um, and I think in some ways that event is a metaphor for sort of the larger conversation that we're having. Um, I think one of the questions for, for, for philanthropists today is, have we been shooting straight over the last 30 or 40 years? Um, we have had a tradition, I think, of, of a strong commitment to human rights, to international law, um, to institution building, capacity building, and so on and so forth. But are we connecting with those places in the world where the social energy and vision creation is going on? Um, now, I'm not saying that necessarily um, <coughs> the World Social Forum in Puerto Alegre is the, is the only place where that's happening. But I guess what I'm struck by is the fact that for the American public, it didn't exist, it didn't happen because the American media didn't bring it to your living room, didn't bring any of the discussion to your consciousness. Um, and in fact, you know, even the World Economic Forum, I think, was scarcely covered in this country. Um, what was exciting about that, I, I guess, for, about that event, and, and again, we've talked about it here a little bit, is the youthfulness of it. It was really brought home to me that um, uh, there were some really distinguished people at that event who have been visionaries and leaders and inspirations to young people like myself in the past, who were there in some sense passing the torch. In some sense, the, the event itself was a kind of a generational chain, change in terms of the leadership of social change movements um, around the world. And there's a lot of new leaders coming up, and a lot of very articulate leaders, and a lot of very constructive leaders that um, I think uh, that we need to connect with and, and identify in the way we de identified and celebrated um, uh, our work at, at lunch today. But there are many more people like that. I think the important thing is not to lose the opportunity and let the vision be hijacked by um, perhaps those who might have more cynical perspectives on the way the world should be organized and the way the world should go. 
Uh, and I think we have a limited window of opportunity to make those connections, to, to um, connect with that social energy, to be a part of discussion about how we build global citizenship and global civil society. And we probably should uh, grasp it while it lies before us. Thank you, Ray. Tim? I just make two very quick comments. One, I think, again, going back to what are our responsibilities in the world of philanthropy, I don't think we can depend upon the press to tell the story. I think it's naive to assume that that's going to happen, and it's lazy to assume that that's going to happen. So we ought to think about committing significant amounts of our resources to telling the story that we think of has to be told. We're out there in a competition for ideas in a marketplace that's jammed with all kinds of things. And we have to figure out how to get through that morass. And that means a commitment you know, to public advocacy by philanthropy. Philanthropy does not do that largely. It avoids it, doesn't like to do it, doesn't want to get its hands dirty, it doesn't want to think about you know, small p politics. And yet, the second point that I would make relates again to the public private side. Uh, to go to what happened in Brazil this last year, I harken back to what happened in Brazil 10 years ago at the Earth Summit. And there. At the Earth Summit, the most interesting outside is the two major treaties on climate change and biological diversity. The most interesting thing that happened was the legitimation of NGOs. You know, the, the UN and the UN system and the international system figured out that NGOs, who had written both of those treaties, by the way, you know, largely had done all the homework, figured out that NGOs were legitimate, had to be engaged, and the engagement of NGOs became sort of de rigueur, became part of what every government does since then. You know, some better than others, but it happened. Now, where we are today, 10 years after, is the same question, but it's the question of how do we engage the private sector and trying to figure out what the rules are going to be. You know, as the UN thinks about that, for example, it has to be, on the one hand, very aware of the fact that it needs the resources of the private sector to accomplish the very ambitious task that it set out to do. It can't do it alone. You have to have that partnership. But on the other side, you have to be very careful about such issues as blue washing. You know, and make sure that you do not sacrificing the idealism and the platform and the mission and the sanction of the UN to get this done. But it's a very interesting, you know, looking about where do we go from here, thinking about that, setting up these rules and understanding what that rule of private sector engagement is going to be and how that partnership works is sort of the challenge like it was thinking about NGOs a decade ago. That, I think, is the new challenge for today. Or well, one significant new challenge for today. Thank you, Tim Silver. Uh, maybe briefly. Uh, I would, I, I think that people here who know much more about the, how to go forward and do things. Two good points. Uh, in thinking, I heard <laughs> civil society a lot today engaging with it. I think few things which I just want to point out that we should remember. Civil society is a contested space. And the other side is fighting very well. I mean religious extremism. Extremists, for example. Good organization, wonderful fundraising, social work, clinics, schools. They do a good job. There is an appeal. We have a great the other side, which is quite a bit. But we can't bring our terms to them. The fight is theirs, the terrain is there. Know that, figure it out, and support them. Because the cost will be paid off losing this war. In a globalized world, violence is going to be globalized too. We can't have one and not the other. Second, very quick one. Gulf between states and people probably has never been as large as it is at this time. Again, to underline how critical this contest over the heart, mind, soul, and weapons of the civil society is. So these two points, I think, in terms of how we think forward from problematically, have to be in mind. Thank you, gentlemen. Very thoughtful remarks. We have time for a few questions in the middle. Uh, do you want to wait for the microphone so we can get the question recorded yeah. that's coming to you? <laughs> yeah. uh, big forward pass here. Yes, 
Yes, my name is Sul Rasku, just individual philanthropist. Uh, I wanted to pick up on a comment uh, Zohar Pagra made, and that is how we got to here. And what I've noticed during this conference so far, uh, and generally on the definition of philanthropy, is always the, the operation of philanthropy is basically a reactive operation. The world waits for disaster, there's an earthquake, you know, uh, uh, there is Afghanistan, and there's, you know, all these things happen, and then the world reacts to what has happened, they put the effort and they go and argue for supporting. You know, there was a great deal of time spent here so far about Afghanistan and all the help it needs and what has happened. And by the way, this hasn't happened overnight. It was, it took about 23 years to get to where it is today. And only the past six months it got our attention. The point I'm making is there are many other Afghanistans there that we don't have the opportunity or we haven't seen anything what we have seen six months ago to react to it. And I think part of the philanthropy and the idea of help, it also has to be allocated for prevention, to be proactive and be sensitive to what's being done today and what possibly could happen tomorrow. There are many countries out there basically having similar pain and sufferings. There are a lot of young people. If you basically look at the developed countries, many of them, you, about 60 to 70 percent of them, are under age 30. In one hand, basically that could be viewed as a hidden goal, as an opportunity to use that population, create a dynamic growth, you know, teach them how you know, place the infrastructure, and have them participate in the global economy. By the same time, as we have seen, that could be a hidden mine. I think there's an opportunity here for philanthropists to be aware of this and allocate, be active with the local government here internationally, and be sensitive to current situations that we are not as much aware of it. Thank you for, the, uh, for your comment. Okay. Do you have a question? Uh, the question, well, I guess this could be a comment or question, so that was a comment. How about a question? <laughs> well, the, well the, I, I guess I'll tell my comment to a question. Uh, <laughs> I suspect which, that. <laughs> which is, what opportunities are out there, what suggestions are out there? How can we work with our local government administration to look at create to look at existing sanctions among some of these countries and make sure we don't have another Afghanistan tomorrow? And in particular, in particular, you know, given the last you know ten years of growth in information technology being enjoyed here and globally everywhere, what has happened that in one way has helped everyone, has helped the whole world. But I think that also has created a problem. Right now you can go to any village in the very farthest you know, world, and you can see still there are people who are available, they can sit behind the terminal and use the internet to, to become aware of what's available out there to everyone and what is not available to them. So we have basically shown them what they could have that they don't have. Could what, you remind me of your question again? <laughs> I think the question I said, as I said, what plans, suggestions, recommendations and how we can allocate part of the assets of this philanthropy you know, organizations out there to work for, be proactive for prevention rather than being proactive. Thank you for your question. Uh, gentlemen, any one of you want to take that on? Well, I'm saying it's largely not the responsibility of philanthropy to do that. You know, it's the responsibility of governments and the State Department to have people who can speak the languages and to have a USAID that's functional. You know, and then what we ought to be doing is to encourage that kind of role of the United States around the world. And that's the job that all of us have. Now, not about, you know, I think that we can do small pieces of this. But the biggest part of this job is the responsibility, you know, most of us are thinking about the role of the United States. It comes up over and over and over again. You know, that's a job that we ought to be doing. They have people at the CIA who speak the languages, for God's sake, and have a State Department that's recruiting people to come into it and not having classes that go by without any new blood coming into the State Department. I mean, it's, it's an astonishing situation. But if we're going to be in trying to understand what's going on around the world, if we're going to be focused on prevention, if we're going to try to be understand what's going on, those extraordinary discussion that we had this morning, you know, why is, the, why is the U.S. disliked as much, if I can summarize the last hour of the discussion this morning? Well, why is that? 
on what are we doing and what are our responsibilities. Well, I think all of us have a responsibility to that as citizens, you know, to become much more engaged than largely philanthropy has been in trying to address that question and the role and responsibility of this government to help to uh, uh, sort a different future. Uh, we are almost virtually out of time. Uh, Jane, did you have something you wanted to say, seeing as you have a special status? Well, I don't dare I don't, I take it. Can I take the last question? You can take the last question. Um, well, I noticed that Gordon Conway talked earlier about Rockefeller Foundation's priority on supporting the indigenous scientific community in order to advance economic development. And I'm wondering about <coughs> what priority might be placed on nurturing the scientific community so that it can offer an independent policy voice uh, in the case of AIDS policy in South Africa, Tim, or nuclear weapons policy in Pakistan and India, as of uh, Are these, uh, should these be priorities for the philanthropic world? Uh, Salvatore, do you want to start with that one? Um, in a South Asian case, if you look at, particularly with nuclear weapons, the people at the forefront has been the man. Few individuals, uh, experts, specialists, and they have to, they are the ones who have pushed for it uh, very strongly. I think that unless we, it's a very narrow one, it will be one of the, a very important thing to do because what we need to do is to raise the level of debate, both at public level and at the policy level. Uh, these voices, while being few, as I mentioned, are very loud and strong because they are linked with social movements and trends. So, for example, a person talking about nuclear disarmament is also the one very active against religious extremism. The two, then you advocate both. You have a much larger audience. It's like a mullah having a mosque. Really, I think we have a lot to learn from some other people who are our integrity. And they are everywhere, all over the world. I don't want to only isolate them from extremists because extremists come in or they are equal opportunity and problems. So very critical. Development of a good link good scientific community. And link it with similar uh, institutes and, and, and community here would be very good. But we need to break down the borders. I mean, this is the most important thing. Uh, and the issue goes back maybe a step even before that, Jane, and that is to the rehabilitation or resuscitation of a lot of the university networks around the world that have, um, you know, in the last 30 years been in significant decline. I mean, for example, I think Carnegie and what Bartan Gregorian is doing is trying to look at this and saying that, in fact, that network can be created. There's a lot of work going on in schools of public health in the country on the AIDS issue. What can be done to, um, to um, put new energy and expertise into a network of public health institutions in Africa? I think that there is a real responsibility there to help build those institutions and build the people teaching them and the science there. And in turn, when that happens, then you'll get the sort of advocacy that I think you're talking about. But Mike, let me just add one point that was made earlier, which I was, I was very struck with what you were saying about how well organized this effort is, you know, for providing public welfare, providing a kind of home that has got enormous appeal. And we read about that in the current conflicts in the, in the world. Let's remember this is going on right here at home. But there is a very, very significant network out there that is working very hard to destroy efforts for family planning and reproductive health in the United States. A very aggressive effort, a very aggressive political effort is going on. And that is reaching not only into the White House, but it's reaching across a lot of institutions. It's now starting to have an impact in other donor countries, in uh, Italy, in, uh, in Ireland, and elsewhere having a very significant impact on the gains that the world has agreed to over a long period of time since Rockefeller began the family planning activities and going through Cairo. There's a good example of a lot of organization going on. A second example is on climate change and revisionist environmental science. There is a very aggressive and well-organized campaign that's going on across the country 
to try to suggest and to confuse, the pe confuse people with the fact that well, climate change isn't real. In fact, there are more forests than ever before. There are more fish in the ocean. You know, it's, it's an extraordinary effort, very, very well funded and increasingly successful. You know, again, it seems to me those who have a different view of the world, and certainly we have a different view of the world, I think most people in this room do, have a responsibility to understand that that is going on in this country as elsewhere, and we have a responsibility to think about that, understand it, and to become engaged in that kind of public policy discussion, right, and to counter that. Closing comment after running a little late. Um, I wanted to comment on a subject that, that hasn't been put forward in quite this way, which is the whole, this, the whole debate on globalization, and the phenomenon of globalization, and how it's being perceived and experienced in, um, in many of the countries that, that uh, are under discussion here today. Um, one of the interesting things I think that's happened at the, since the end of the Cold War is that. I think for those of us in the international development field, willy-nilly globalization um, uh, market integration has become, in some sense, the default development paradigm. The way we did our work during the Cold War was, I think, in some, in some ways, very, very different. And today, we find ourselves um, uh, in countries where the whole issue of, of uh, market access is really sort of driving the development agenda. And for average Americans, you know, this is the, imp the implications of this aren't necessarily altogether clear. But for many folks in, in countries around the world, the issues of how the trade rules are constructed, whether there's real equity in the global trading system, are really deep, deep concerns, and they can see the consequences of those uh, of those phenomena in their own societies. So I think as um, we talk about these issues of um, international engagement. Uh, more broadly, I think we, if we want to be sensitive to and in touch with the way these debates are taking place in, in, in the rest of the world, we need to be sensitive to this discussion and sensitive to this debate. It's really those questions that are bring, that brought 60,000 people to Porto Alegre. I gather, I, I, I would be, venture to say there'll be 80,000 people there next year, and this is what they're talking about. But the, this conversation isn't taking place in the United States, and so the question is, how do we promote a discussion on um, the implications of the, the so-called free trade model for our own citizenry and for citizenry around the world so that perhaps the positive aspects of globalization can be made to work for poverty alleviation rather than against it and for peace and justice as well. Thank you, Ray. I thought it was extremely provocative and interesting conversation this afternoon. Thank you all for your attention. Uh, we're now on to the breakout sessions.